here for a while, no better. Uh, we're still in the book of Revelation, uh, and I'm excited to be able to get back to this passage and to finish up uh, what we had started with, uh, with the book of, with the Jesus letter to the church at Philadelphia. Uh, everyone who has come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ wants to serve him. Uh, we're born again, it seems, with an innate desire to glorify the one who saved us uh, and to, to be of use for him in his kingdom, in his plans, and in his purposes in the world. Uh, in other words, to have some sort of ministry. We don't have to put that official title on it, but that's the idea. We want to serve him in some capacity. But there's always this question. What if circumstances find us in a place where we can do precious little? Where we just don't have the opportunity or it seems the means. Maybe, maybe there's poor health that's intervened. Maybe you have few contacts. Uh, some of you have just moved newly to the area and you don't know anybody. How do you, how do you begin to serve in that way? Maybe, maybe you don't have transportation. So you can't go out during the week and do anything for anyone else. Or, or what if you have little or no money to give? Because that always seems to be on the top of the roster for some. No, identif- no identifiable work to join yourself to. No clear task to be a part of. So what if we're not gifted like others and don't seem to have anything really concrete to offer? Can't teach, can't preach maybe physically disabled or weak or sickly or whatever might be the circumstance, how can I still serve Christ acceptably if that's the state I'm in, if those are the conditions of my life? Can we still advance his kingdom? Can we still glorify him in some way? And Jesus' letter to the Philadelphians that wants them to know, yes, indeed they can, because they're in a tough spot. This church is not in a place where they've got a lot of ease to reach out, and yet he, they find out in this just how easy it is. Matter of fact, it's, it's a lot simpler than they may have thought at the time, and maybe it's a lot simpler than you and I think, too. Here we're going to find out exactly what Jesus meant in Matthew 11:28 when he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he appends this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To be honest, I don't know a lot of Christians who believe that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Somehow we've transformed that into something it shouldn't be. But as we work through this today, I hope you'll find that that's absolutely true. Now, last week, we looked a bit at Philadelphia's history and the glorious encouragement of Jesus to them in that very opening sentence of his letter. You remember that. And and Philadelphia, for those of you that weren't here, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Philadelphia was a city that was set in the middle of an earthquake plain. So much so that in the time when the, when Jesus wrote this letter, the people pretty much didn't live in the city because the buildings kept falling down. There was such a devastating earthquake in AD 17 that the emperor gave them five years reprieve on their uh, taxes so that they could rebuild. And then they were struck by economic disaster. They were the richest wine growing region in the entire empire. And Caesar, in an unthinking move, came in and said, you know what, the empire needs more corn. Let's cut down half the vineyards and plant corn so we can help the empire. Except you can't grow corn in the same soil that you grow grapes. And so it totally devastated them economically. And so you've got this weak, and we'll find out, persecuted church that's in an economically depressed place and is constantly running for aftershocks from earthquakes, even almost 100 years later, and they're struggling. So Jesus writes to them in that very first verse of, of this, uh, picking up in, uh, in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one 
opens. To a church living in a place of poverty and continual upheavals due to the earthquakes, victims of governmental flip-flops and mismanagement, and persecution by the local Jewish community, Jesus reminds them that he is the Holy One. And he is the true one. And he's the one in ultimate authority because he has the key of David. The the full authority of God rests on his shoulders and he's the one who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one will open. That because of who he is, they stand in a much different place than their external circumstances might make it seem. And though they have no access to the throne of political power back in Rome and they're suffering due to their location, and labor under the whims of foolish and sinful leadership, their situation has to be understood in far different terms than just those surface facts. No matter what things might look like on the surface, the reality is far different once Christ is placed in the center of the whole matter, and we understand their relationship to Him and His relationship to all that's going on. They must know that Jesus the Christ is their Lord and King, and he's king over Caesar, he's king over creation, he's king over earthquakes, he's sovereign over circumstances, and certainly over his own people. And this Jesus, who has has full authority of heaven above all, he opens for them a door of access to the very throne of the living God that no one can shut. So that's this incredible encouragement right out of the gate. I want you people to know these things. But then, as we've followed through in each of these letters, there's the same fourfold pattern that he follows. The next thing he does is he gives his declaration of insight. And this declaration of insight comes in two parts. In verse 8, it's insight regarding the Philadelphian church, and in verse 9, regarding those that are persecuting them. So to their church and to their persecutors, he writes these two different things. To them, he says, I know your works. And behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut, referring back to what he just said. And I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. And then to others, he writes, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Very powerful, and we'll come back and we'll unpack it as we work through this. So let's go back to this first part that he writes to the church. I know your works, and I've set before you an open door, and I know that you have little power. Now the implications of that should be pretty plain. They aren't too hard for us to pick up. What little work you can do, I've noticed. I know your works. I know you're not in a place where you can do a lot, but I have still paid attention to what you've done. I haven't overlooked it. I notice little strength, and this is what we need to pick up in this. Little strength is no bar to service. Because you don't have great ability doesn't mean that you can't serve Christ. They're still a working people even in the midst of all of their opposition. And the second thing you note there is that little strength is no bar to full entrance into the kingdom of Jesus. He has set before them an open door that no one can shut. We unpacked that last week. And so they can enter in regardless of what their detractors say. And thirdly, that little strength is of no hindrance to real effectiveness. You might say... As we unpack this and we look at the things we can do, but is that really effective? And I want you to know, yes, it is. But that evokes the question, doesn't it? Why? How is it that being poor and having no power is no detriment to serving God well? It's interesting. We preach a lot in our context, which is affluent America. How do churches in places where there's nothing serve Christ. Where where church is under a tree because they have nothing else. Where where the mean income may be 30 cents a week, if that. Where they have no vehicles, they have no internet access, they, they can't write a blog. 
and, the, and they're really restricted. What do you do? Or what do you do when you get too old to come to church? Or too weak or too sick? Or something else hinders you? He says, I know your works and I've set before you an open door and I know you have little power. And why is it that those aren't hindrances to serving God well? Because he says, I know you have kept my word and not denied my name. Interesting. What does it take to be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ? Two things he mentions here, coupled with the open door that he already referred to. Keeping his word. Keeping his word. Knowing his word. Cherishing his word. Obeying his word, preserving his word for the next generations, proclaiming his word. It doesn't take much to be able to do that. You can do that all by yourself. You can know his word and love it and saturate yourself with it. And especially when it comes to the gospel, to keep that word, to not veer from the gospel of Jesus Christ irrespective of what's going on around. He says, you do that, I am very pleased. You've served me. And I take note of that. Believing and trusting his word so as to live your life by it. That's pretty easy, isn't it? God is exceedingly easy to please. I don't know where we got this idea. I I love the term that John MacArthur uses that, that to make sure you know God isn't the cosmic killjoy. That he isn't standing behind a tree somewhere just waiting for you to mess up so he can jump out with a two-by-four and whack you upside the head. That isn't God. He's delightful and he delights in his people. He's easy to please. He's not hard to please because we're accepted in the beloved. We're already accepted in Christ. When I was a little kid, they tried to teach me artsy, crafty things in school. Uh, I flunked all of those. I wood shop. I made the worst little bookcase for my dad that ever existed. It would not stand upright, and it had misshapen things on the side. And dad used it. He put books in it, but you couldn't put more than one or two in it because it was too flimsy. And then, and then they gave us modeling clay. My my machine shop experience was much worse. I won't even go into that because there was blood involved. But uh, uh, when they gave us modeling clay and we were going to make things. They, they brought in somebody with a, you know, a potter to show us how things go. And I made this, I don't know what it was. It, 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 it kind of looked like a, a candy dish, but it wasn't quite big enough to be a candy dish. And I, I have no aesthetic sense, so I painted it really bad colors. And, and when you set it on the table, it leaned over and Mom used it to put paper clips in to try and and sell. But, you know, the thing was, I I brought this this misshapen, mispainted, horribly formed thing, and I gave it to my mom because I made it for her, and she received it like it was precious. That's how he deals with us. He receives our most meager, misshapen, poor works because we're his children, and so it's precious to him. But how often we make it so difficult that God is so high that we can't do anything that pleases him. Ben was just up here with Augie. Augie doesn't have to do anything. He's just cute because he's Augie. And you love him. And you just got to accept what comes from him because he's Augie and he's just your child, and you say, yes, but I'm an adult child, (laughs) not compared to a God who's ageless. No, he's so easy. And then secondly, not only keeping his word, but the second thing he adds, not denying his name. And essentially for them and their context, it's refusing to compromise on who Jesus Christ is, something we really need to do in our day so that we uphold his deity and his humanity, and we uphold his substitutionary death on the cross, and and his ascension to power, and his soon coming kingdom, and especially the exclusivity of salvation in his name alone. Because they would have been in a position where that would have been challenged all over the map, but 
they did not deny his name. Maybe there's a separate way we can make sure we don't deny his name, that if we're going to take his name on us, we live like we have his name on us. And they apparently were doing that. Living the Christian life as a Christian and publicly as his, not backing down from bearing his name. Those of you that were in Sunday schools, we saw that video from David Wood. And uh, as, as we were praying before service, Brian Smith said to the, to the rest of us, you know, he was caught by the, by the fact that, that when David was in jail and he was with this, this Christian who was in jail with him, that when he tried to, to really push this Christian down and to detract from him and to give him a hard time, the guy pushed back. He said, no, I, I know where I stand, and I'm going to ask questions about your presuppositions, and I'm going to deal with those things. And he, he did not deny the name of Christ in the face of those who were trying to, to push him down. So what does it take to be a faithful servant of Christ? Well, he gives us two here, and they're pretty simple, aren't they? This is an easy yoke and a light burden. Keep his word and not deny his name out there in the culture. Important. But let's look at the second part, because this adds an awful lot. And then, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Now, to unpack this well, we need to be reminded that Scripture delineates two very different kinds of Jew. The inward Jew and the outward Jew. And Scripture makes this distinction. We, we read about it especially in Romans chapter 2. And here Paul lays this out, writing as both an ethnic Jew and one who's born again. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Now, this is going to have some importance for us as we work through the book of Revelation because there's so many today that seem to have confused the fact that the Jews were God's people with somehow that we should just back everything they say and do because they're ethnic Jews. And that's simply not the case. And Paul gives us the rationale here. One is, no one is a Jew who's one merely outwardly. Your mere ethnic status is not the key here. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and the circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from man, but from God. What the new covenant reveals to us is that there is a people of God, ethnic Israel, the Jews, whom God chose out of all the peoples on the earth to be his And the means through which he both kept the ongoing communication with the world and through whom the Messiah would come. No question. And while they were, or maybe are, truly God's people, that isn't all they were. This becomes vitally important for us in the New Testament. They were also a type or a picture of the final spiritual people of God. They were not all that's wrapped up in being God's people. And confusion on that point makes us make a hash out of a lot of the prophetic literature that comes our way. So we're taught this in Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, writing to Gentiles, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, the Jews, by what is called the circumcision which is made by the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time, this is prior to their conversion, you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The importance there is going to be you're no longer alienated from that commonwealth. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... Say that that situation has shifted. That's no longer the case. Now, in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Not by becoming Jews, but by partaking of the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one 
believing Jews and believing Gentiles, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. You don't have to follow all those Jewish commands anymore. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. You catch that? There's a, a new man that's in place of the two. There was ethnic Israel and there were believing Gentiles and now there's one man instead of the two. So making peace and, and that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that's us Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, those were the Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, what does all that mean? It means this. You're no longer strangers and aliens. Hmm. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. Fellow citizens with the believing Jews. And members of the household of God. I thought Israel was the household of God. Right, but now you've become part of that household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's pretty amazing stuff. Earth shattering to the people in Paul's day, but this has a lot to do with what Jesus is writing to this Philadelphian church. Because this brings up an amazing scriptural irony that comes to, comes to pass. And once again, Jesus assumes, like he did last week, that the Philadelphian church are going to make a critical Old Testament connection and do that in light of the radical transition that's taken place since Jesus' birth, death, life, and resurrection. So... What's the connection they need to make? Let me put it in my words first. The church doesn't replace Israel, as so many, I think, have errantly suggested, but rather the church is the fulfillment of what Israel began and typified. Israel was the root, but the church is the full flower. The people of God, both Jews and Gentiles, who are born again by the Spirit of Christ and are reconciled as Christ's people to the Father by his blood. This is the church. You see, there's and, and why this would be difficult for Jewish people to hear in that day, which is going to play into this letter, is that there is a perennial problem with us taking things that God has done temporarily or has put in place as a type and shadow and trying to make the final substance out of it. This is always problematic. Uh, let me give you one good example. It would be what happened back in the case of 2 Kings 18 and Nuhashtan. Um, you, you probably don't use that word, Nuhashtan, in your regular conversation. So let me go back and show you where it comes from. This is during the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was bringing great um, uh, revival, if you will, and restoration to Israel during his kingship. And he, Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. They had gotten themselves involved in idol worship. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Remember that out of the book of Exodus? When the, the, the people had rebelled and God had Moses put up a bronze serpent so that, that anyone who looked on it would be healed if they had been bitten by the fiery serpents that God sent among them for ju judgment. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. They had taken what God had done in one place and one time and made an idol out of it, made it a permanent fixture. He says, you can't do that. As soon as you do that, you've turned it into something it shouldn't be. This is why the Jews failed in terms of, of finding righteousness, because they made the final thing the law and not the righteousness of Christ that fulfills the law. When you make an idol out of that, you mess everything up. The same thing happened with the ephod that Gideon made after vanquishing the Midianites in the book of Judges. What was God's memorial 
what was a memorial to God's victory for them became an object of worship. Look at this in Judges 8. So Gideon made an ephod of it, uh, the things that he had taken in, in battle, and he put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. We can take things that God has done in one place at one time and make a memorial out of it such that it becomes an idol. Now, we can do that with the nation of Israel. They had taken the fact that they were God's people and ordained for a purpose, but assumed that's the fullness of God's purpose, and it wasn't. In fact, there was much more yet to come. So, in Jesus' words here, the very promise that was originally given to Israel about her persecutors is actually going to be fulfilled in an ironic twist by the Jews themselves as they reject Jesus as Messiah and Lord. And they will eventually have to come down and acknowledge that the church is the true Israel of God. Mind-boggling. Now, there's three references to this in the book of Isaiah alone. Isaiah 45, 14, Isaiah 49, 23, and Isaiah 60, 14. Let me look at Isaiah 60, 14 for just a moment. This is God prophesying to the, to the Israelites. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. What did Jesus just tell the Philadelphians? Hmm. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. What's happening? The unbelieving Jews who are persecuting the church will actually fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah in this amazing ironic twist. What a fulfillment. And how it's transformed under the age of the new covenant. It takes on an entirely new dimension. So these Jews who were persecuting the church, and precisely how we don't know, the text doesn't tell us, perhaps by saying that the Christians have no part in the promises of the kingdom of God because these belong only to ethnic Jews, these Jews are now stylized by Jesus, the synagogue of Satan. And by their attempt to close the door to salvation to anyone but themselves, find themselves fulfilling this prophecy, but on the wrong end. They, in fact, are the ones who will have to come and bow down before the Christians and acknowledge that they are the city of the Lord. And so Jesus actually says that in verse 12, that he will write on them, on the believers in Philadelphia, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Fascinating. Believers, Jews, and Gentiles are citizenry of that new city, not mere ethnic Jews. That moves us to the third part of his letter, and that's the call. And so because, back to the Philadelphians, you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon, so hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Now let's just look at that briefly. The promise, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Now, some have interpreted this as implying that those who hold fast to Jesus' name and the word will be raptured and kept from the great tribulation. I'm not going to be able to go into the topic of the great tribulation today. We're going to have to do that later in the study. But whether or not that's there, what it does state clearly is that regardless of what faithful Christians might have to endure, they will be kept by God. Somehow they will be kept. Now perhaps this keeping will be more in line with the keeping of Noah during the flood. He and his family were kept through the flood, but they weren't kept from the flood. 
They were protected as they went through it. So when God causes his judgment to come on the earth in final tribulation, uh, he'll keep his own safe and secure if we go through it. Now, there are some who say we won't go through it. I, I don't believe that, but I'm rooting for your team. I don't think that's what it teaches. But, but the only other place, and, I, and we've got good cause here, the only other place where this same grammatical construction is used interestingly enough, is in John 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. And in that prayer, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Don't remove them, but preserve them. Keep them, set your mark on them. I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Secondly, he gives the promise of his soon coming. He reminds them, I'm coming soon. So, so keep looking forward to the promise rather than seeing the here and now as the final word of everything. Because when you're undergoing difficult times, you've got to know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus says, I'm, I'm coming. I, I know it's rough right now, but, but keep that. And the idea of soon here, I think, is not so much the idea of how quickly his return is related to their particular point in time, but that there's no delay in it. He isn't being held up unnecessarily. He will come at the right time. I'm coming soon. And, and all is going according to schedule, and nothing will delay it. I can't read that phrase without reminding myself of something my wife told me back when we were, we were after we had uh, decided to actually get married and... Uh, I was, I had foolishly told her I loved her on the phone before she was ready to hear it. And, you know, there's silence on the other end of the line. Just, just what you want to hear when you've declared your un, undying love. You know, silence. And then that statement she makes, well, you know, uh, I need to hear more of your tapes, which was just earth shattering. I didn't, I didn't know where that was coming from. But, but, but later she confesses to me that she had already bought the wedding dress. All right. And it's, it's hanging on the wall while she's, she's, we're having this conversation. So I was out of the loop. She was in a whole different world at that point. And so later she just told me, well, it's all going according to plan. That's a, say, I didn't know there was a plan, but she knew there was a plan. And so often, we don't know what his plan is entirely, but we do know that there is an end to that plan. He is coming. He's coming soon. Philadelphians, I know you're small. I know you're worn out. I know you're suffering. But I'm coming. I really am. I'm coming. And so hold fast. Hold fast to what you have. They don't have much. But hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And we don't have time to do a whole word study on this right now, but there's, there's two words in the New Testament for the word crown. They're two very different words. They, we don't see it in English, but you would see it in the Greek very easily. The one word is stephanon, which is the kind of crown or the wreath that you would get when you completed a race. And the other word is diadema, where we get our word diadem. That's a royal crown. There's only two times when diadem, two two circumstances under which diadem is used in the New Testament. One is for Christ being crowned, God being crowned. The other is when the Antichrist crowns himself, tries to take royal power. In every other instance, when it refers to Christians, you know, we we sing the song, we'll cast our crowns at his nail-scarred feet, although that has to do with the 24 elders, and we're going to unpack that in a couple weeks, and that's probably not what we think. Um, but, But it wouldn't be diadems. It would be the wreath of somebody who cross the finish line. The crown was awarded those who finished the race. In a marathon, there's only one winner. But everyone who crosses the finish line is recognized as having completed the marathon. And so it isn't about those who started the race, but about those who finish the race. And this is the way it is in the Christian life. Christ is the only one who has won the race. He's done that. But we're all still in that race And the question is, will we finish? That's the simile he's using here. Don't let anybody take your crown. Don't let them cause you to veer off course to not finish what I've set before you. There's a finishing that needs to happen. So Jesus mentions the faithfulness of keeping his word and of patient endurance. Since Philadelphia was also the site of early contests that were similar to the Olympic-type games, this would have really resonated with them. They would have picked up on this picture right away. 
But what does it take to hold fast, to conquer in their situation? Because that's what he's saying. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar. What, what does that mean? Well, holding on to what they had. Holding on to his word, keeping his word, and upholding his name. And, of course, we've also already seen last week, entering in through the open door that he has provided. This is Jesus' easy yoke and light burden. For those who do finish by keeping his word and upholding his name, he gives a threefold promise as he closes. First, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. In direct contrast to the literally shaky ground on which they live in this earthquake-ravaged region, they will be made a pillar and they will never go out of it Isn't that interesting? What do you do when there's an earthquake? You run outside. You don't stay inside where you're buried by the rubble. And he says, guess what? When I come, when you've finished the course, you'll never have to run outside from an earthquake again. There'll be no more going out, no more upheavals. I will have put an end to all of that. What will they receive in Christ? Absolute, never-ending security. Freedom from all upheaval. Eternal, absolute stability. And For those of you that have gone through drastic upheavals in your life, nothing is more comforting than to know the day will come when there will be no more turmoil. None. What a promise. I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And you'll never go out because it's safe there for eternity. And second, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, that I promise you, you'll never be in upheaval again and I promise you, you are going to bear my name. You've not denied my name. I'm going to write it on you. Is that some sort of an apologetic for tattoos? I don't think so. The idea is how perfectly they'll be identified with him that they bear his name. And once again, it would appear that Jesus is making allusions repeated from the Old Testament motif of how often God promises to put his name on his people, a people called by his name. Uh, In fact, in the great Levitical blessing that the priests were supposed to give to the people, he says, this is how I want you to put my name on them, to bless them as being mine. But there's one place in my estimation that outstrips all of those Old Testament allusions. It's the one we already had read for us in Isaiah chapter 9, where he will put on his, his own new name. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, name, singular, not plural, his name shall be called Wonder. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Of his name. I know I've, I've done this before for you, but just let me go back and revisit it once again. His name. Hebrew scholars argue that that passage out of, out of Isaiah 9 is in fact one hyphenated name. I, I used to work with a guy by the name of Bob Schweinsberg. All right? And Bob Schweinsberg married Janet Dunkelberger. And Janet decided to hyphenate her name. So she was Janet Schweinsberg Dunkelberger. You can't put that on a form. Uh, I don't, it certainly couldn't fit on her license plate, but here's a hyphenated name that really works. Pele Joez El Gabor Abiyad Sar Shalom. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Prince of Peace. Ever, everlasting Father. That's a name. He's someone to write my name on you. You're going to know that you're mine. And you're mine in the fullness of all of this. 
in the name of the ultimate supreme authority and power that rules over everything. You'll bear my name. What a promise. Did you know that the city of Philadelphia had changed its name several times? After the the emperor had been so good to them in relieving them of taxes, they changed their name to Neo-Caesarea. We are the new city of Caesar. And later, when another Caesar got married, they decided to name themselves after his wife. They called themselves Flavia for a while. Jesus says, you know, all those names can go by the wayside. We'll be known as those bearing his name, not as Rochesterians, not as evangelicals, not as Protestants, not as Reformed, not as Philadelphians, not as Americans, but as Pele, Joes, El Gabor, Abiyad, Sarshalomians. That'll be our name. Wow. And just so, just so it isn't a mere label, he uses this graphic illustration. I'm going to write it on you. I mean, it'll be part of you. And there's no getting away from it. Bearing the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Not the old one. Not, not O oh, Philadelphians. Not Neo-Caesareans. Not... No, not Flavians, but the new Jerusalem. And then at last he gives his reminder, always the fourth part of each of these letters. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Be encouraged, Philadelphia. (laughs) That's what he's saying. And once again, beloved, maybe you've agonized about whether or not you can really serve God effectively or with lasting impact given your particular situation or lack of resources or opportunity or ability. I don't know what that might be. And he would say to you, yes, absolutely, yes. You don't have to have a huge ministry. You don't have to have a title for it. You don't have to form a 401c3. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can serve me acceptably. You can, you can advance my kingdom and my plan and purposes in the world. Hold fast to my word and uphold my name in a world that, that rejects my person and work and, and the exclusivity of salvation in my name and take advantage of the, the door, the open door that no one can shut. Ultimately, become a person of prayer. Seek his face on behalf of others, his church on on behalf of this nation and the needs of the saints that are around you. Plead for the return of Christ to consummate his kingdom and, and all of its fullness. The weakest, most poorly equipped, least able Christian can enter into the throne room of the living God and have his ear. And no one can shut that door on you. Nobody. He hears you. Be a praying Christian. No one can keep you out and no one can render your prayers ineffective. The smallest ones. John Flavel, the old Puritan, wrote this. Prayers. The best office one Christian can do to another. Bingo. You say, I don't know how to pray well. I watched a fascinating video yesterday of a young girl with severe autism. She's 15 now, 14, still can't speak, has never been able to speak. Uh, They recognized her severe disability at an early age, and uh, she has a twin sister who's quite normal and progressed, but this girl uh, had very severe problems. The the kind that called for 40 to 60 hour a week individual therapy to try and meet her needs. So unable to function. At times screaming, at times flailing, at times banging her head on the floor, and of course unable to talk. And one day at the age of 11, they sat her down in front of a computer. And thinking that she was so mentally deficient that she would never ever even gain the the normal life of a six-year-old, sitting down at the computer, having never uttered a word, she typed out, hurt. And then the word, help. And all of a sudden, 
They found a door into this little girl's mind. Now, a couple years later, she's writing a novel. She still can't speak. She writes a blog. (laughs) She emails people all over the country, especially other autistic kids. And she's, she's amazingly articulate. What I say is that the believer, if you can't form words well, he knows your heart and mind. You go to him and you pray. And you can do more for the body of Christ than the best preacher or teacher alive. Yes, you can have a ministry. Hold fast to his name and hold fast to his word and enter in that open door that no one can shut. And beloved, you will be performing on the highest level. Spurgeon writes this in closing. Prayer is the never-failing resort of the Christian in any case, in every plight. When you cannot use your sword, you may take to the weapon of all prayer. Your power, your powder may be damp, old allusion to old guns, and your bowstring may be relaxed, but the weapon of all prayer need never be out of order. Leviathan laughs at the javelin, but he trembles at prayer. Sword and spear need furbishing, but prayer never rusts, and when we think it most blunt is when it cuts the best. Prayer is an open door which none can shut. Devils may surround you on all sides, but the way upward is always open, and as long as that road is unobstructed, you will not fall into the enemy's hand. Prayer is never out of season. In summer and in winter, its merchandise is precious. Prayer gains audience with heaven in the dead of night, in the midst of business, in the heat of noonday, in the shades of evening, in every condition, whether of poverty or sickness or obscurity or slander or doubt, your covenant God will welcome your prayer and answer it from his holy place. Nor is prayer ever futile. You may not always get what you ask, but you shall always have your real wants supplied. When God does not answer his children according to the letter, he always does so according to the Spirit. It doesn't take much to please him. He's a wonderful God. And he tells these weary and troubled and plagued Philadelphians. <laughs> Keep my word. Don't deny my name. Come through the open door. And he is delighted. He will know your work and reward it. Father, I thank you for your word again today. I thank you for